I learned that from. Whoops. Okay. And. Uh, oh, yes, they got it. I think the thing that I remember just her kindness, her willingness <clears throat> to help everybody uh, at all times. She was always there, uh, eager to help everybody. And that was really an example in my life to, to be eager to help other people. Uh, specifically her family, of course, but also anybody in the church or anybody at work. She really did worry about other people and she wanted to help and do other things for them and to give all that she had. And she didn't get anything in return. She didn't look for anything in return. Uh, she gave all she could without anything coming back to her. And uh, that was also one of the big lessons that I got uh, from my mom that I've tried to follow in my life in terms of service and uh, to look just towards other people's needs. Because, you know, we've been blessed and when you have those kind of blessings that we've had it's important to give back to others and i say these things in the name of jesus christ amen turn it over to diane can everybody hear me um i just want to thank everybody for coming and i appreciate everything that everyone has done for our family i want to thank eric for doing the slideshow at the end i just have a few stories too and when i was in kindergarten we had this little girl come and she was new and she was introducing herself and she said she was jewish and i didn't know what that meant so of course i went to my only source of truth in life mom and i said what does that mean mom there's a new girl in church and she's jewish and she said that means that she goes to church just like you but in a different building and she's new and you should go be her friend. And I said, okay. So of course I just do exactly what she tells me. So I go to kindergarten and I said, hey, Cindy, mom said you're supposed to be my friend. So we were friends after that because that's what you do when you're five. And I spent the night at her house and she had the coolest Barbie house. It had an elevator. I had never seen that before. It was, it didn't work very well. It was plastic and, you know, Barbie didn't go up and down very well, but it was the most amazing thing I'd ever seen. And Cindy became the coolest person in kindergarten because she had that elevator. And I thought I never miss an opportunity to meet someone new or share with someone else because they might have an elevator in their Barbie home. They might be the coolest person and if I don't reach out and meet them because of something that they are or something that they've said, I might miss out. And I never forgot that from when I was five, that whatever people tell me about them, it's a descriptor, it's something to learn from, it's not to be scared of. And that has shaped me so much in my interaction with people in life. And when I was in junior high, Mom worked at the cable company. Of course, cable was super new back then because I'm 100. And their Disney Channel had just opened. And they sent all sorts of cool prizes when you signed up people for Disney. Do you remember that, Dan? She would talk about stuffed animals and T-shirts and bags. And the one that really stuck out to me that I always wanted was the um, Mickey Mouse watches that played music. So cool. And of course, mom was super nice. Nobody could ever say no to her, especially in customer service, because it sounded like your, your mom was calling you, telling you to do something, you just did it. So she always won all these fabulous prizes. And so at dinner, she would tell us about these fabulous prizes that she'd won or gift, you know. And I said, where is it? And she was like, oh, well, I, I gave it to so-and-so for their child. What? Why? <laughs> well, she needed that. You know, her, her, her kids would like that. And that went on for months. She would tell us about something she'd want at work and it, it would never be in our house. They'd always go to somebody else and around Christmas time. So she told us about, you know, they were doing these big raffles and stuff, all these things she was collecting. And, and I said, why are you collecting those for other people? And she said, well, it's Christmas time. And you know, this family has like five kids and that way they all kid can, each kid can have something from Disney. And I was always like, why is your kid not getting those fabulous prizes? And she said, she would just kind of blow it off every time because it happened all the time at dinner. 
I know as a teenager, everything should be about me. So I, one time, you know, I badgered her and badgered her. And one time I finally, we were of course in the kitchen where all women live when you have children. And she was either cooking or cleaning and probably cooking because she didn't like the cleaning part. And I said again, for the millionth time, my little selfish, why can I not have one of those watches? Why are we not, you know, getting all of those fabulous prizes? And she stopped what she was doing. And she looked me dead in the eye and said, because it's the right thing to do. And after that, I never asked her again why she did anything. Because I knew it was because it was the right thing to do to help people. And it was the right thing to do to give to others. And that was her, always her mot motive for all of her actions. And so it has shaped my entire life and my entire career working in mental health and helping people. And when I tell stories that make other people throw up and they're like, I can't believe you do that. Why would you do that? Why would you choose to, to put yourself in those situations? I always think because it's the right thing to do because mom taught me it's always the right thing to do to help other people. And those people might have an elevator in their Barbie home. And I want everyone to feel like they have the elevator in their Barbie home, that they're all the most important person in kindergarten. And everyone that she met I always heard throughout my entire life, even when I was little, you have the coolest mom, or I want a mom just like yours. And so when I had kids, I knew exactly who to pattern my motherhood from so that other people's kids can be jealous of my kids. And did I do that perfectly? No. Mom knew that. She heard all of my complaints and all of my joys. And she still supported everything that I did. When I made what she called the worst mistake of my life, she said, when I told her I was doing it anyway, she said, it hurts my heart that you are doing this. I've never felt physical pain from one of your choices before. And I did it anyway. And when I told dad, he said, well, you always do what you want to do anyway. But I knew in that moment that she would still support me, that she would still love me, that she would do exactly everything that I wanted and needed to have done, even though she didn't support that decision because her undying love and her trust in other people never wavered. And of course, when I realized that it was absolutely the wrong decision, and had to correct that, the same thing. There was never, and I told you so, there was never an eye roll, which I still do all the time. I cannot get rid of it. She was there with love. She was there with support. She was exactly what I needed, regardless of the fact that I had hurt her heart, that I had physically caused her pain. I thought she was gonna have a heart attack, to be honest. But she always knew how to support you, wrong or right. When somebody offended her and said something painful, she would tell me, but she would never retaliate. She would never say anything against them. She just felt sad and hurt, but she always knew that they were someone who was saying something and were a good person. It never tainted her view of other people. The only Disney that I have, from when she worked at the cable company is Hippo from Fantasia. One day she came home with this horribly ugly hippo. And I knew it was from Disney. I mean, obviously you can tell it's a little hippo from Fantasia. And I said, why, why did she bring that home? I thought, my gosh, there's these fabulous Mickey Mouse watches running around playing fabulous music. And I were getting the hippo. And she said, I, I said, did, did nobody else want it? Is that why we have the hippo? And she said, I love the hippo. I wanted the hippo. The hippo is going to stay 
in my room. It's mine. <laughs> and it reminded me in that moment. And I think of this little hippo. And I've got, I still have her. I put her in mom's room. That everybody deserves a little something for themselves. And that we're all important. And that even though she served and she gave her entire life thanklessly, we all deserve a little something. And it's important to take care of yourself. And she had this hippo in her room. I mean, our parents had a lot of junk, but she never lost the hippo. And he's, she's still beautiful. She has her tutu, which amazes me after children have played with this. She never took it to church to share with someone. She never, it was always in her room, either in her closet or on that treadmill she never used. It was always there. And it gave her love and it gave her something that was just her. And so when I have a tough day and I need something that's just for me, I think of this hippo. I don't need anything physical. Nobody's going to have anything at my memorial there to show besides jewelry. But I can mentally think of the hippo and how she deserved something and she kept it for herself. And it wasn't anything for anybody else. She didn't share it with me. She didn't, we, you know, we talked about it. We laughed about it. We laughed about her too, too. But it was hers. And it was something that she, she wanted and she kept that for herself. So I take that minute every once in a while to think of this little hippo and he stays in my closet. Well, she stays in my closet. So that I remember mom and remember the important things that she taught me and that I'm important. And that's a hard thing for women and some men to feel, to feel important, no matter who's telling you what or who, what you're going through and other people are doing that you're still important and that you still deserve love. We're gonna pause here for a minute, see if my kids wanna say anything. <laughs> she hasn't thought about it. <laughs> okay. That's, that sums it up. We're not gonna do that today and that's okay. So is Michelle here? I can't tell. I don't think so, I, don't, I haven't seen her. There's some iPhones on here. I didn't know. Okay. I don't hear her either. <laughs> Michelle, if you're here, type in chat. <laughs> right. <laughs> She's here. All right. Does anybody else want to say anything before we start our um, slideshow? Nothing else you can say. <laughs> mm, there's an iPhone on here, but it's muted, I think. No. Who are you? <laughs> Who are you people? Who are you people? Yeah. Yeah, I still have that Mickey Mouse watch. I know. I know we're going to talk about that later. Okay. okay. Yes, I'll, I'll say a few things. Uh, this is Bishop Ryan Wand, and I. I get it. I appreciate the informality of this. This is nice. Thank you, Dan and Diane, for <laughs> doing it like this. Um, you know, I was I was thinking about. Carol this morning and and uh, when I became bishop I didn't really know Carol previously that well we kind of sat on opposite sides of the chapel and never the tween shall meet um but when I became bishop it was right away she could kind of see you know I had the deer in the headlights look and didn't really <laughs> maybe appreciate or understand everything going on and she had this way of she created an instant bond she just kind of knew what I was going through and I don't know how how she was able to do that maybe I, I don't know if your dad had served in church leadership or something but she just kind of understood and inherently knew how I was feeling and what I was doing and you know bishops have to have some kind of relief out of sorts and she seemed to be mine like I could just talk to her and she became kind of my confidant that I could talk to her and and share things I was going through. And she just understood inherently some of the drama and other things that, you know, you deal with and was just very incredibly supportive. And just, I looked forward to, you know, every Sunday, I, you know, go back and just talk to her, sit down with her for a few minutes. And it was just kind of my time to almost relax as Bishop and just talk to her and kind of my therapy, just having her hear me out and give me some supportive words. And she was just always so generous and kind in that way. Um, 
and you can see that you know that, that's passed on to to both Diane and, and Dan. You can I can actually I don't know if you guys know this or have been told this, but you can hear Carol in your your voices. Like she is here <laughs> through your voices. You guys sound just like her, and um, and it just so much mirrors of her and her her kindness and her personalities. Um, she was always you know to your point about thinking of others. You know this time of year she would ask every time this year does anybody need help is there anything we can do to to help people and she was always thinking of how can we reach out who needs help who's the, the specific specific ones that i can can reach out to or maybe help with some something for christmas um and she just she was that way she was just kind of inherently geared to not worrying about herself or uh, her situation but to to others in fact we we would go caroling this time of year the youth would go caroling to, to various houses and and widows and so we would go to her house and every year she was just like no i don't need the caroling you need to go to somebody else like she's like there's other people and she could list off people like did you go here did you go here like she's like i don't need the caroling take it take it somewhere else where they really need it you know so she was just that way always thinking of others and and putting herself last so um to me it truly was a, an example of the savior in the sense that she understood people at their core and could relate to them and and had such a generous spirit about her so she was she was great thank you i know one time i actually was stopped in the grocery store by this random woman and i she's like are you carol birch's daughter and i said yes i i don't know you she said, I work with her. You look just like her. I've seen your picture on her, on her cube, but like, you look just like her. And I was like, wow, that is scary. <laughs> I will never be not Carol's daughter, no matter where I go. It's so true. I've seen younger pictures of grandma and she looks just like her. <laughs> yes, you're about to see those. It's hey, Diane and Danny, this is Debbie Doyle. I don't know if you remember <gasps> me. Of course I do. So I'm old and wrinkled now. <laughs> you look fabulous. <laughs> You're very sweet. Listen, I just wanted to jump in and say Carol would, she was very, well, she was my best friend, honestly, for years. And then after I moved away for years, if we just called each other, it was like no time had passed. She was, we were, she was the best person ever, but she would, um, she would go like at four o'clock. I don't know what time early in the morning. And we would walk every day because that way I could get home and get my kids up and get them out the door to school. I had seven children. So it was a lot of work, but also I just have a, I'm sitting here at Katrina's house. <laughs> <laughs> so this is my youngest. And so Katrina was the last one at home and, and your mom, would say, listen, just drop her off when you're doing errands. You just need some sanity time. Just, you know, drop her off. Katrina called her Brother Birch. <laughs> <laughs> she couldn't say Sister Birch. She called Brother Birch. And she goes to your dad, to Tom, she goes, so if I'm Brother Birch, he's going, who, who am I? You know, what's the deal? <laughs> what's, what's the deal? So kind. And she would let us bring the kids over and swim. We remember your dog, the Holly, so sweet. Anyway, I have a lot of fond memories of your mother. She's an amazing person. Glad to see both of you. Oh, you're muted, Diane. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Katrina, she loved hanging out with you because you were the youngest of seven. So she reminded you of her when she was little. And she always told this story about you that when you came over and wanted a snack, she said, well, I'll make you a secret grilled cheese sandwich. And so she put two pieces of bread and cheese in a microwave and melted it. And you were like, that's the best thing ever. And one time, Debbie, you had to call and say, what's the secret grilled cheese sandwich? You know, wants it. I don't know what it is. That's and of right. course, it sounded like she was going to be like breaking out some sort of fabulous gourmet moment, and it was a microwave. <laughs> well, she actually taught Katrina. Oops, I can make that myself. I was oh, like, as a little yeah. kid. <laughs> That's hilarious. All right, thank you. Thanks for sharing. Crowd cheese is supposed to be toast.
All right, Eric, you want to go ahead and do the slideshow? Okay. Thank yeah, you. go ahead and share the screen with me. Hold on. I think mom might need some help. Hold on. We just did it. Did it take you off? No, I, nothing's changed on my screen. Can you? I mean, this morning when you were playing it. Hold on. Slide your mic. It's not giving me that option again. Hold on, let's do more. Oh yeah, it was security. It says you should share your screen. Let me put it back on again. It... Yeah, it said he disabled it. Okay, try it again now. I took it on and off. There we go. Okay. Yeah, you fixed it. Okay, can you see it okay? I can see it. Yeah, somebody said who they were. <laughs> oh,
Going through all these pictures of mom was really fun for Dan and I to kind of go through our childhood. But it did remind me that before I die, I do need to erase a lot of pictures of myself. Oh, no, I, I never, I'm not letting that happen. I'm not letting that happen. Nope. Mm -mm. Okay, that was it, Diane. Thanks, Eric. That was great. Dan, can you close us out? Thanks everybody for uh, coming and uh, watching the Zoom meeting. Uh, the pictures were really wonderful. Uh, appreciate all the work that uh, Eric did to do that and grateful for my sister for uh, putting this all together with the Zoom meeting and inviting everybody. And uh, grateful for again, all the love that my mother showed and the example that she gave, not just to her family, but I think to everybody who knew her. And uh, Grateful for all the love that everybody's uh, been sharing on Facebook and texting me and my sister. And uh, I'm grateful that uh, we were all able to be together at this time. And I say this in his name, Jesus Christ, amen. Amen. All right, thanks for everybody for coming. Have a great holiday. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas. Merry Christmas, everybody. Merry Christmas to everyone. Thank you very much. Thank you.